Here is, this is the photo I took today, by the way. This is um, Ariagonum amii. This is the newest buckwheat that I know of. Um, and it's one that, it's the East Bay Wild buckwheat. It's one that we found at our nursery. And it, it's a cross between um, Gigantium, or St. Catherine's Lace, and um, Fisiculatum, or the and the, which is the California buckwheat. And this one, um, <coughs> the first, and I have some actually here uh, also, but it grows extremely fast and extremely large, and it flowers. Last year it flowered 10 and a half months out of the year, so which is an amazing amount of time. And the seed is viable, and it's loaded with pollinators. So it's a very popular one. And it's very white, white flowers. Uh, looks like snow. Um, it's very beautiful, and it, it's this, the one end of the mother plant of them all is about 12 feet across now, 12 to 15 feet across, a single plant, and about this tall. So it's a big one. Um, as you probably know, uh, St. Catherine's Lace, Gigantium, can get gigantic. It can get very big. Um, and I've seen those ones up to about this tall before, and they, but not nearly as big across as this one does. Some of them, some of the perennial buckwheats are spreaders that spread out, and some of them are, I guess, ballers. <laughs> the globe, they, make, they form like these globe-like shapes, uh, mounders. Um, the most of them mound. Um, but all of, for all of the buckwheats that there are, there's, you know, you split them between, there's two main different kinds, the annuals and perennials. And they're both wonderful in the garden. So I encourage people to, to try both. And I don't think of myself as like an, any sort of an expert. I just am a gardener, and I really like to work with, with buckwheats and different plants that I find in the wild and try to grow them in gardens. And I've been doing that since I was like 10 years old. Um, so I, I, I think of all of you as my peers more than as an, I don't think of myself as an expert. Um, I'm not a botanist. I'm not a scientist. Um, so really, it, um, I just finding out this stuff through experimentation. And I like to share the information with other people who are experimenting also. And I think of this as more of a discussion rather than a, a lecture or something. So please, if you have any comments or any experiences of your own with buckwheats, um, please speak up, OK? Yes? And as you talk about each individual buckwheat, would you be sure to tell us whether they're, whether they're sun, completely sun lovers or they tolerate shade? Sure. How sure. dry? You know, OK. Yeah, that, I mean, that's an easy one I'll just answer right now. That there, there's almost, there's so many buckwheats. It's the most prolific uh, in, in species um, of any plant. They, they say that there's more penstemons, but I counted today. I counted <laughs> them. And if you look through Calflora, there's be, of the different varieties and subspecies, there's almost 500 in, in buckwheats. And there's only, there's under 300 in penstemons. So I think buckwheats wins <laughs> as the most prolific number of species. And the, the, it, its cradle of evolution is definitely California. The whole West has a lot of different buckwheats in it. And in, but in California, it seems like every, you know, never mind county, but every neighborhood practically has a different buckwheat, or at least a slightly different variety um, of buckwheat growing there. It's just amazing how many we have. And it's the iconic plant of the West, I think, also. So, and they start flowering, in general, they start flowering around now. Um, this is a generalization. And they go from now until the free, you know, until we get freezes or till winter starts, pretty much. So they're long flowering um, perennials, and some are short-lived and some are long-lived, uh, but many of them are very long-lived. Um, and, but the two that do well in the shade are, that I know of, um, are arborescence, which is beautiful in the shade, much more beautiful than in the full sun, in my opinion. Um, and the other one is crocatum. Um, and crocate, they both need a little bit of direct light, direct sunlight. So they need, you know, an hour or two a day at least um, of direct sun to flower well. Um, but arborescence in particular looks just fantastic in the, in the shade. Uh, it has this real architectural look with peeling bark and long stems and, and long branches and these cool little Dr. Seuss-like tufts of leaves. Um, so anyway, I'll talk more about them when I get to their photos. And how do I move on to the next photo here? Oh, it's got to be a quick way to do this. Oh, uh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, there. 
Daredevil or something. Can I just look at go by this one? Right there. Okay, here's another one. Of, this is the East Bay Wilds buckwheat, the Amii. I named it after um, my friend Dave Ame. Uh, some of you might know him. He worked for Cal Flora for, for excuse me, Cal Trans for many years um, during their reveg stuff. And then he's been with East Bay, East Bay um, Regional Parks for the last few years. But these are all the Amii, the ones that I named after him. And he retired last year. Um, and he gives a lot of talks on California grasses. Uh, but he's also fascinated with buckwheats and stuff. So he's been a real mentor of mine, along with a few others, like um, Wayne Roderick was a real mentor of mine, and Roger Rage and a few others. And that's how I learn about stuff, is for, through other people that have you know, been doing this for years. Um, and I've been doing it for like 12 years now. So my oldest gardens are like 12 years old now. So these are all Amii, this is that. It grows very large, it's very hardy, and completely drought tolerant. And now we're into, um, an, this is an annual one that I found. These are, these are not good photos, I'll get some better ones. But this is a pinkish flower, here's a good photo of it. This is an annual one called angle stem buckwheat, or angulosum. It's native to Santa Clara and Alameda counties. Um, it's fairly rare, but loaded with flowers, and grows very quickly. Um, into a really nice little shrub. Uh, and I tried it by seed last year and I got a few nice plants in the hottest, driest gardens that I had. Um, the, the gardens that I had that had partial shade or a little bit of shade or were slightly cooler, closer to the coast, forget it, they disappeared quickly. So do they send up volunteers because they have so many seed heads? Um, they, you can get them to come up by seed and for the annuals and the perennials if you use a mulch of decomposed granite. That's the important thing, um, you need, and it needs to be fairly weed free. They don't compete well with other plants. Um, so the main, you know, the big detractors for these wonderful plants are, there's two. One, they, d they can't handle weeds, so you have to have a pretty well weeded area. Um, and the other thing is deer, okay? Deer, if they can get at them, they will. So they don't generally eat them to the ground, but they'll eat all your flowers off at least for a few years. <laughs> So, <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> she likes deer. <laughs> anyway, this is a, an angulosum. Sometimes, and there's so much variety even within the same species, and even even the ones that don't have different varieties. They, there's some incredible variety. I've seen some nudums that have been a mass of of flowers and a mass of stuff this tall, just mass. You can't even see through the. There's so many stems of them. And I think I have some photos of those too. This is arborescence, by the way. This is growing in the shade, in the partial shade, um, in a garden in Berkeley. And you see how it has a really nice um, look to it. Um, if they can get quite large, I've seen them in the full sun in Livermore. I've seen them in the full sun get this tall uh, and form a perfectly round globe. And um, I just don't like the way they look so much. They also kind of tend to burn a little bit on the leaves. And, the flowers turn brown pretty quickly. But in the shade, they flower forever, and they look great forever. So they get different colors in the leaves, too, as the leaves die. These are all arborescents. So, so do you let the, do you deadhead any of them, or do you just let them go? I let them go, because I mean, I like the russet colors of the flowers after they go by, but you certainly can, if you like. So th definitely, we're, when I've gone through and collected seed from them, I'll deadhead afterwards because it looks like a mass of twigs. But here, I, I love using buckwheats with rocks. You know, they have this really soft, sort of um, cushiony feel to them. Um, and then they just combine, it just contrasts so nicely with rocks. Um, and i always experimenting, trying to grow them different ways. Took this photo today too. Um, I have large ones too that I grow in large containers as well, and I'll cover that coming up. So this is a garden not too far from here. That um, it's and I have some of these that I planted 12 years ago, and they're still doing beautifully now. I, I have seen places where they don't do really well. The arborescence I'm talking about. This is the Santa Santa Cruz Island buckwheat. And the places where they don't seem to do really well is where um, they get a lot of traffic on top of them. You know, their branches break and they're they're brittle. Um, and then they just sort of send up a few twigs, and those few twigs look pretty cool, and 
but they look kind of bonsai like but there's they don't really produce a whole lot of foliage and they're not super fast growers in general except for the the east bay wilds one and the gigantium are very fast these are more arborescence you can see the arc, the sort of the architectural thing i was telling you about this, the way that they have this layered effect their their flower their flowers come in these big huge um, flat top bunches, you know, that, and they can be this big. Each each thing can be the size of a dinner plate uh, with their flowers, and their flowers are generally white with a little bit of pink in them. And I'm always looking, selecting for ones with more pink or more white, and or something different about them. So I've got a bunch going on. I have a bunch of some of these ones that are here today have much pinker flowers than most. So. Here's, a, here's another very recently f named one. This is one that um, was discovered on, in, the, in the cedars on Roger Rach's land up in Sonoma County. And this is Cedrensis, or this is Ariogonum Cedrensis, and it was just got its name about two years ago um, and was found about five or six years ago by Roger. And this is extremely hot, dry serpentine, so it's not real welcoming uh, territory for other plants as you can see here this is like the major serpentine area very hot and dry and you can see the little bunches the little pink sort of bunches can you see it okay the little bunches that are down there that are kind of little cushions throughout the talus area talus is something that buckwheats love it's one of the one of the environments that they exploit to the max is talus and talus is where it's broken rock that on a slope where it, tends to slip a lot, um, and that's where they are. Here's Ariogonum cinerium, um, and this is one, this is in Big Sur. This grows all over from about Big Sur south and inland, uh, and they can get taller than me. They have the long, tall wands, uh, very white stems. Here they are on the side of the road um, with tiny little pink flowers. And then this is Covillianum. This is one that I have here, Covills. Um, this is a neat little one that has the leaves turn pretty colors too. And this is one of my favorites is um, Crocatum uh, or Conejo buckwheat. And this one is it, it like, there's a couple, this is a, there's a couple throughout here, a bunch of them. But this one, I have one that I'll show you a picture of soon. That's, um, it's over 10 years old. I've had it for over 10 years in a container. And it, it does very, very well in a container. It's very long lived in the ground or in a container but it just wants to be in the right spot where it gets a little bit of shade and a little bit of sun. Um, and it, it likes to be dry. It, it, even it, it's even really pretty when the flowers are beginning to, to come out. So it looks like this for about a month, sometimes two months before it flowers, these little chocolate spots like all throughout it. And those are the flowers that are gonna open up. See right here, it has very soft white velvety leaves. And then it has, this is the 10 year old one that. Well, this was a few years ago, it's bigger now. But it has a trunk on it that's like a couple inches thick. And I just keep cutting it down whenever it gets too unwieldy. And then it grows up again and spreads. This is the way it looks in a garden. Um, and it can take full, full sun too, um, just fine. But I like to put it sort of on the, under the edge of a, of a tree or something where it can get a little bit of shade. Pete, what kind of container um, a soil mix are you using for your right. I use um, all soilless mixes. I use potting soil with a lot of lava and of the small pieces of lava and pumice. Pumice is probably the most important thing that I use. And I fertilize with a slow time release fertilizer. Um, but the, the what works really well is um, what's it called? The one that's the, uh, um, Osmoco. Mm -hmm. That works fine. Um, Osmoco. Osmoco. And don't use much of it. Very little bit of it. Um, this is a and this is a very old plant. This plant is, I think, like 12, 15 years old in the ground, and it's slow. Crocatum is one of those that's really slow. These are all my crocatums at the nursery. It took me a few years to figure out how to to grow them <coughs> from seed to get them to do well. I, I think in years past I would get like three or four or five a year, and this year I got like 300. So <laughs> finally got it down. My new nursery location has really helped a lot too. So here it is with the seeds coming in and it has all these great little colors in it. it 
the colors, it, after the flower goes by, it turns kind of um, sort of russet colored first, uh, and then sort of orange at first, then russet, and then sort of a chocolate brown, and that chocolate brown against the white leaves is also really attractive. Here's that one today, the, the one that's 10 years old in the pot. So, so and how you can, often does that get water in the pot? Um, once a week, once a week in the full sun. Uh, but here's one that actually grew pretty fast. This, th I took this photo today too. I went to see this, land this landscape here that I did um, about a year ago, or li less than a year ago now, just to see how it was doing and to see, and I put a lot of buckwheats in it. This is a raised bed with a lot of rocks in it, with a lot of boulders and rocks and um, a lot of buckwheats. Um, I'm going to talk also about plants that grow well with buckwheats. Um, and here you can see quite a few. Um, but here we have the, the conejo buckwheat right in the front, the closest one. And then the ones that are turning orange there, that's the Shasta sulfur, which is a very, very reliable and easy buckwheat to grow and beautiful too. And it flowers for a long time and sometimes it, it usually has a double flower season an early spring, or earlier in the spring, and then a later in spring, or, or early in summer, I should say, flowering, um, and both, which, both of which are really pretty good sized flowering. Um, it spreads to about three feet across, and about one foot tall, maybe up to maybe one and a half feet eventually, um, very long lived, and it's found that, it's a particular kind of umbilatum. What, the, among the, the gazillion different buckwheats, umbilatum is the most prolific. There's many, many different kinds of umbilatum. Some of them have leaves the size of a pinprick, you know, and then others have, you know, great big leaves, big round leaves the size of a, 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 a silver dollar. And they, um, but they flower really nice, and they usually have yellow flowers on those. So there's a million different umbilatums. But this one is polyanthum. Here's a crocatum again. And behind there, there's a plant that does well and looks great with them, and that's the um, leafy reed grass, Calamar grastus foliosa. And then there's an olive there too. That we had to deal with the olive. That was part of the garden when we started the job. The olive had to stay, and everything else got to go. So everything else is native. Um, here's a one that is that I do sell sometimes, but I don't have any right now, unfortunately. Um, but next year I'll have a bunch. This is elongatum, the long stem buckwheat. And these can get taller than me, um, and they put out a lot of, of stems, but they look really good in a meadow with a lot of grasses, and they can, this one can outcompete grasses pretty well. It gets really large, very white bark, and, um, and, Adam, por que no lo llevas afuera, no? So anyway, Ilangara, and then it gets all these pom-poms, these whole rows of pom-poms all along the stem. So. Quick question, so yes. when you were showing like the ones by the curb and then with that olive tree, but are, um, are these good for uh, parkway plants, you know, like the parking strips, do you make like a rock garden? Maybe? Yeah, they're not bad, they're not bad. I have them in some parking strips and some sidewalk strips. Um, I do grow them in them and they're not too bad. Is generally, if they get a little protection, some of them do better than others. The arborescence has done fine. The crocatum has done fine for me. The, of course, the fasciculatum, that's the California one, that does great in pretty much anywhere you put it, mm -hmm. as long as it's full sun. Um, and you give it enough water to get going in the beginning. But, um, yeah. Yeah. That, they get broken off really yes, that's so true. The, the, the brittleness is, makes it difficult. But if you have other plants sort of growing around them that can sort of protect them, like where I have them growing, doing well in parking, in sidewalk strips, is where there's like ceanothus growing around them. And they're coming up through the ceanothus. Uh, and then that way they're protected by that. They seem to take like dog pee pretty well. They don't, you know, they don't die right away like so many plants do. Um, and they, it doesn't even seem to phase them. So which is a great thing, but they are very brittle. So they, do, they cannot take being walked on at all. So this is a really easy area because it's raised up. Um, manzanitas, I grow them with manzanitas all the time. And you find them in the wild always with manzanita. This is a long item also. See these long, so it looks pretty cool where you have like a dark shady area behind them as a backdrop and then these white stems just coming all over the place in front. Um, 
Now we're into the fasciculatums. Um, here's fasciculatum. This is the California buckwheat. And there's a whole bunch of different kinds. Um, some of these are foliosum, foliolosums. Some of them are the, the polifoliums. And then there's a bunch of others as well. So but these are the foliosum and the polifoliums are the ones that are found around here along with the straight fasciculatum um, of the California buckwheats. And some of these get very tall up to seen them up to seven feet tall, um, but the foliolosum stays nice and low, stays about three feet, and the polifolium does also. Polifolium has whiter leaves, but they can be very beautiful, very, very white to pink, and then they can be solid pink too. So, but generally they, they have pink buds that open to white flowers. That's the common, commonly seen one. This is a foliolosum in the Oakland Hills, those ones. Here's a nice, um, a place where I have it growing in a, in a, behind a barn that had been converted into a house. And we did a landscape there and it was pretty wet down below there. So we have carrots of nupta or sluice edge in the bottom here and behind it, we have this huge, it just keeps spreading, this enormous uh, patch of fasciculatum there. And it's really beautiful. Yes? Do you ever need to trim or does it um, tolerate being trimmed? Yeah, it tolerates pretty well being trimmed. Just in general, don't, prune it back too much unless you're really patient to let it grow back. Don't cut it to the ground. It's nothing you can compass. Well, I, I had one and, uh, you know, it's like the, the flowers are still brown. And then, you know, the next year's flowers will come out through that. Yeah. Can I get trimmed all that? You can. You can. It's up to you. It really depends. It, normally where you find them is in windy areas um, in the wild. They're almost always where, where there's quite a bit of wind. And the wind really takes care of that in the wild. In a garden that's where it's more protected, they can stay on. So you can cut that off. Should I do that in the fall? I would do that after or in the winter time sometime, so before they start new growth. Um, but you can cut. They can take a lot of cutting back too. Here's in a garden in Fremont where we have the, the really nice patch of it in front, small patch, and then behind it it's all um, hummingbird sage and carpentaria. Here's a, a large patch of it in the wild. This is in Napa. This is kind of a weird photo. This is taken with a cheapo camera that I had a few years ago. I just started photography in the last few years, so it's really a new thing for me. But this um, here is a, a patch that's probably a quarter mile across um, of it growing up in Napa. This is Fasciculatum, and it's very pretty actually. Even this is after the flowers. This is around October, so the flowers have long gone by, or, or they've just gone by, and they're all brown. But it's so pretty. The brown is just like perfect. And here's when they're really fresh. This is growing in Big Sur. See the pink buds and the white flowers? Then to white flowers. Here you can see a close-up of the flowers and the anthers. This is the best bee food you can give, you can have. This is for bees. I, we do, in my nursery, we have three hives that um, are, were placed there by a group of people that, and they're using my nursery to nurse back sick hives and hives that are having problems. And because of the, all the buckwheats, I think it's the main reason that they, they come back really quickly. And they tend to swarm really quickly too because they grow way too big. They grow, they overgrow their hives really fast. So um, apparently they, they both the, the pollen is excellent for the bees and the nectar on, on buckwheats. So, and I've seen bee on, I've seen honeybees on every kind of buckwheat we've grown. So. Um, this is more fasciculatum. This one almost looks like latifolium there, but it's fasciculatum. This is also fasciculatum. Um, but there's, as you can see, there's quite a bit of difference. Some of them stay pretty low. There's one, a ground cover one here called, um, it's on the list called, uh, what's it called? Lytle is the last name. Warner. Warner Lytle. Yeah. That's a really, really, really strong, good um, ground cover for hot, sunny slopes. Um, it's an excellent plant, and it's hard to find because it's so sought after. And which one's that? The Warner Lytle, and it's a fasciculatum. It stays pretty low, um, but it's great for the hot, sunny slopes where nothing else wants to grow. That will do well there. So um, here it is. It, the 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 build up to when the flowers open is quite a long time, but just that. The appearance of them, even when that's building up, the buds themselves are really beautiful too. They have a really cool shape and design to them. 
So here's a garden where somebody might recognize this. It's actually her garden. <laughs> it's not too far from here. This is a long time ago. Yeah, it's grown up a lot since then. Are there red, orange? Is that the buckwheat in the back? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of buckwheats here. That's a that's a the fasciculata there, in the in the background with a russet color, the brown. The flowers have gone by. Here's one a garden in Fremont again, the fasciculatum. This is fasciculatum foliosum in the Oakland Hills, um, with very pink flowers in it. Some of the ones here have very pink flowers. And here's the pol oh, I did have this. Good, I'm glad I had this photo. This is the poliofolium. This one is not very well known around here, um, and it's pretty rare, it's up around here. It's found, the only place I know of where it's located is in um, Sunol, near, not, on McGuire Peak, and this is McGuire <laughs> Peak in Sunol. And it has much wider leaves, and it seems to clump much more, like much more mounding rather than spreading. Um, Oops, that's some, this is, oops, I somehow I got um, some of the, this is, this is what we were calling it before, uh, this is the East Bay Wild buckwheat, sorry, I didn't realize I got in there. So here's another uh, typical buckwheat environment, um, this is in Big Sur, above Big Sur, um, this is uh, um, Fort Hunter Liggett, and this is Chaparral, south and east facing with very fast graining sandy soils here. Um, so it's very, very hot and very, very dry here. And what you see growing around it, you, there's a lot of Arctostaphylus glandulosa, which is the Eastwood manzanita, a lot of the Erica maria um, arborescens, which is the golden fleece, which looks beautiful with buckwheats, by the way. Golden fleece is a really beautiful plant and does well in very hot, dry gardens, but it needs to be very hot and dry garden, full sun. Um, are any of you familiar with golden fleece? The way it, it's, it, it has bright, bright green, very fine leaves, needle-like leaves all over it. So it's, it's the brightest green you can imagine in the garden, um, right through summer. And then it gets covered with this um, golden fluff-like flowers, you know. And it's very pretty late in the summer. The golden bushes always do really well with buckwheats and look really good with them. I brought some of the prostrate golden bushes, the coastal one, um, which you'll see pictures of later on. Um, here's the St. Catherine's Lace, and now we're into the Giganteums. This is the one, the really giant one. But if you have a really big area, that, a big, really big yard, or a really big, even a roadside or something that you want to um, have things growing on to help keep the weeds down, Giganteum is perfect. They grow so fast, they're so hardy, with or without water. I, I always like to give them a tiny bit until they get going, um, but then they're on their own. Um, and they're really beautiful and really interesting looking. And how often or how would you prune something like that? You know, because eventually it looks like it's just going to... Well, if there's enough room, then I'll just let them flop. And they just have this kind of wild look to them, but they're beautiful <laughs> still. And they get this very neat, tidy look to them automatically in the spring. Yes? Occasionally I cut those flowers off. Yeah. Wait when they're ready to be cut off. Yeah, sometimes they weight them down a bit, and weight the branches down a little bit, and look kind of funny. In that case, yeah, cut them off and, and um, they'll pop back up again. Could those compete with ivy if you're trying to have them take over an area that's covered with whatever that weedy ivy is? Um, hmm. I'm not sure. The ivy usually likes partial shade and St. Catherine's Lace really needs to be in full sun. Okay. So, but if, it, if there was ivy there, I think that St. Catherine's Lace could probably outcompete it pretty quickly. So. Anybody have experience with that? <laughs> so this one, this particular Giganteum is a, is a sport. This one is a little bit odd. The leaves are very small on it, and the, but it's covered with flowers, completely solid flowers for months on end. So that's a neat one. Here's another plant that grows really well with buckwheats, with the St. Catherine's Lace in particular. This is the, the California Fuchsia Catalina, which is a tall one, it's like this tall white leaves and big red flowers. So between the bees and the hummingbirds, it's a pretty busy place in the garden. Um, I, I, lo I love planting like St. Catherine's Lace in front of different colors, you know, because the, the colors are so unusual of the leaves and even the flowers, and even when they go brown, the, it, there's such unusual colors that you, if you plant it in front of different colors, structures, 
um, they really stand out even more and it looks like very otherworldly. This is, the, um, this is a clinic in um, San Ramon, a, a plastic surgery clinic where we've done the landscape there and they, um, it's the first Leeds building in San, San Ramon. There's more St. Catherine's laces. The, the flowers begin to turn. They turn a little bit brown like this. And then they get like deep chocolate brown after a while. This is in the nursery. We have a lot of little things like these guys in the nursery. <laughs> Does it ever become an invasive tissue? Um, it, 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 Gigantium is, inv is, can be invasive. Down south, it's invading a little bit around the beach areas um, because it's so prolific. It's pretty easy to control though. Yeah. Uh, one, one yard where we planted a whole bunch of it, we used a lot of decomposed granite in this one yard in Hayward, and then we just threw a bunch of seed out, and it, I think everyone came up, we had uh, thousands of them. Uh, and we just, we just went through and knocked out a few, you know, and by the, now I think we're down to like two or three there. It's not difficult to control. Um, I have a million babies of them coming up all around the nursery, but you know, it, it, I just, if you, if I, I don't have to do anything and they'll all just die. You know, if I want them to live, I have to give them their own place, you know, because they do need room to expand. So, so the buckwheat's hybridized easily? In the yes, very easily, which hence, the, you know, the 500 variations of buckwheats in California. So um, in, your, in your nursery, how do you control your species? Well, I try to put the one, well, I, first of all, I don't let the ones um, that, that I'm not crazy over the colors, I'll, t I'll knock them out before they produce seeds. I'll cut them down. Um, or I'll even kill them before they, they produce seeds. Um, and then, but what I like to do is I'm always putting them, the ones that I like, even different species next to one another that have um, characteristics I like to see what comes up. And um, sometimes it's pretty interesting. So like the, the amii, that is definitely a really interesting one. Um, but, and then sometimes it just happens on its own. But really I put them ne next to one another to see what I can get. So, or, or I'll just, if I want the solid red, red ones, like I have, I brought one with me today that is a deep, deep red color. And I have a few at the nursery. And that's just from putting, over the years, putting the, the reddest ones together, you know, and getting, and I ended up with a really deep red one. There's one in here is somewhere. It, is it see. this one yeah. or is it a different Yeah, this is, a, this is one here. There's another one over there. It's a, it's, it's a very deep red color, which I really like. And I, now I really, now I would like to, could probably cross that with latifolium to try to get shorter flower stems and fatter, thicker flower stalks and bigger heads on it, which is similar to the rosy cushion one here, which I'll show you some pictures of in a minute. So, so you propagate always by seed then? Yeah. yeah. It's easy. It's very easy. If you have decomposed granite particularly, that really does it. So, and sometimes they have green, very green leaves, and sometimes they have very gray leaves, and sometimes they have very white leaves. More gigantium, I have so many gigantiums. I really like the way gigantium looks near deer grass and white sage. The, the list of th plants to, that go well with buckwheats at the bottom there, that's a very short list, and really, there's so many things that do really well with buckwheats and look really cool next to them. Um, the, but definitely, deer grass and um, and St. Catherine's Lace look really cool together. Here's the chocolate and white look once the flowers have gone by. And here's one all in flower. Do birds eat the seeds? Um, birds, they do eat the seeds, but not, I mean, there's always a million more to get. They, they produce so much seed. It's amazing. Um, apparently, they, down south, there's places where the St. Catherine's Lace is crossing with some of the local species, so there's some concern about planting it in some of those areas, so, but not around here that I know of. So this is all just more St. Catherine's Lakes. Now we're into Grandi Robescens, which is probably everybody's favorite one. And this is one of my favorite combinations, actually, is one of the shorter ones, like a rosy cushion. This is one is called Lollipop, um, which, and I don't have any this year, Lollipop, uh, but I will next year. Um, but I have some offspring of lollipop. But, oh, this is a very close to lollipop right here. See how it has shorter stem, much shorter stems and big flower cup clusters. So uh, this is a really good one. And I love planting it with the, here you have it with the um, 
David's Choice Sandhill Sage, the Artemisia pycnocephala. Um, and I love how it looks together. And I love putting Grande Rubescens together with, with um, Nudum Ella Nelson's Yellow or Ludiolum or just any of the Nudums really, because I love the look of the different colored pom-pom flowers together. And they all will form these just giant masses of flowers around this time of year. See, here's, here's a Ella Nelson's yellow growing together with the Grande Rubescence, the nursery. And it looks great with grasses. This I took the other day. This is growing with the, the prostrate golden bush, which I was telling you about here. The green that's there, that one stays pretty prostrate and gets covered with these golden yellow flowers. I brought a couple of those today, too. That's a hard one to get, but it's a beautiful, easy plant, very tough plant. They sometimes have really cool stems, like here. Um, I had one at the nursery last year, I still have it going there, uh, that I think it's a polyploid. I think it had, it had doubled genetics, genes. Uh, polyploids tend to grow very large and have really unusual characteristics. And these ones had eight foot tall stems for their flowers. And they just twisted all over like a giant octopus. They're <laughs> proud of the nursery. So here, this one is, um, this is actually one that I think is a cross between the latifolium and grande rubescens. Latifolium and grande rubescens are very, very similar. Um, and they cross a lot, so it's easy to get crosses. Here's the ones at my nursery last year. Um, then, and I keep trying for the really deeper colors and the bigger, fatter flowers. And I like the really tall ones, and I also like the really short ones, so I like to have both. Here's a, what's that? Which ones? The, all the grande rubescens? They, generally, they're about three feet to four feet across. I've seen them probably even up to five feet across. Um, and then tall, like two, three feet normally, but occasionally more, occasionally less. So here's one in a large container. If you want to grow grande rubescens in a container, it has to be a large container. It has to be really something that holds at least five to 10 gallons. This is a 10 gallon um, industrial waste container that I've been growing it in for a couple years now that looks really cool in it. So here's the deep red ones, the nursery, really bright red. He, and then, yes. So you're talking about how, how you're um, selecting all these different Grande Rubescence cultivars, but I haven't seen any named ones in the trade. Um, am I just missing that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few. There's Rosy Cushion uh -huh. is one. The, um, the other one, Lollipop. Uh -huh. uh, then there's Offspring of Lollipop. And, and so, once, yeah. so once you get one like Rosy Cushion or Lollipop, are they seed propagated or are yes. they cutting grown then? They're seed propagated. Okay. Yeah. The, you can grow very easily uh, buckwheats by cutting, but I don't understand why anybody would do that because they grow so well by seed. And just they, to get them to be true to the form. Yeah, but if you if you have them close to the same, um, or by themselves, they'll you'll get them true to the same. They're, it's not that difficult. I don't think that the pollinators tend to travel really far at all. I mean, with the, I think they stay pretty close from what I've seen of what what we end up with. Although there's always the the um, extreme it, uh, exceptions to the rule, so, which we've seen a lot. So these are all different ones at my nursery. So here it is growing with Nudum. And I just like the look of the, the white and the pink like that. It's really nice. The Nudum, or, oh, I'm sorry, this is Parvifolium growing next to it. Parvifolium is probably the easiest of all of them to grow. And they grow quite large, um, really pretty quickly. And this is a white one here. Parvifolium is usually white, although they can also be pink. And I have some pink ones here too. And they, parvifolium, it mean, parvifolium means small leaved, and they have small leaves all up and down the stems. I can show you one here. I think. Oops, maybe not. Let me get the cut over to the other side. Right yeah, these are, these are parvifoliums with really small leaves. These are the parvifolium with pink flowers and some with white flowers. Um, and then I have a really nice one here somewhere that's the, called the Theodore Payne. 
I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Buckwheat um, Theodore Payne. It's a parvifolium that was put out by the Theodore Payne Foundation. That's a really, real beautiful one. And I have a bunch of those at the nursery. I think I brought a few today, a couple anyway, somewhere. So here it is growing on a slope. So, so can I say yes. something about parvifolium, which yeah. is cliff buckwheat, right? Cliff buckwheat, yeah. Yeah. It seeds like a son of a gun. Yes. So if you <laughs> so if you aren't careful, you'll end up with a lot of them in your yard. Yeah. And that may or may not be what you want. Yeah. But it, it, if you if you rather than try to weed out all the seedlings, just wait until your yard is just a few giant plants, and then it's very easy to remove them. Because <laughs> they don't all survive. Only a few of them will survive. So they, they do weed themselves out pretty easily. So with just a little bit of intervention, you can get rid of them quickly. So that's the thing. Buckwheats tend to, they tend to come from one single solid uh, root um, sent in the very center of the rosette. Uh, and then the plant moves out from there, but you, it's very easy to break it off at that point and then the plant is gone. So even if it's a, a 10 foot across plant, so it's not difficult to remove. Parvifolium likes to be full sun um, and, and it also nice, likes sort of like a bit of a wild area, slope, full sun and um, plenty of room to just spread and it will spread. So, and it's, um, it's very pretty. It flowers for a long time. Can take water or doesn't need water. Um, I planted some in San Ramon and I went and saw it the other day and whereas some of them were doing okay, latifoliums and parvifoliums, whereas some of them were doing okay, others were just, it's just too hot over there for it and they would just fry. So that's one area where it does need a little bit more water and a little bit of shade, I think. So here's Newtum growing with um, grinder rubescens again. Another thing that I love to grow with um, grinder rubescens in any of, in luteum, lute, excuse me, not luteum, but um, nudum elenelsens, is the, in the background there, it's the bright green plant there. That's a, a desert olive, Forestiera uh, pubescens, and it is local, although pretty rare, um, but there are some up on the Mount, Mount Hamilton and a few other places around. But that's a very, very hardy and beautiful, um, quite large shrub to grow in the full sun, and it, it has this beautiful bright, bright green color. In the spring, it's like almost a chartreuse color, um, and then in the summer, it's just beautiful bright green. <coughs> and it is deciduous, but the stems on it are white. The, the bark is white on it, and it has a really, new, really cool um, form to it, where the branches sweep downwards, and it kind of looks like dancing people. And it, it's very, very pretty, with and without leaves. Uh, it's also called New Mexico privet. Oh. But it's one that a lot of people have not seen or tried, and it's a great, easy plant, shrub to use. So here's more grounded rubescence growing with the Ella Nelson's yellow. Here's, um, here's another nice combination, a tall grounded rubescence growing with verbi verbena delamina, ver verbena lilacina delamina, the delamina verbena. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's a really cool combination. Here's the one growing in the industrial can, the nursery. This is a lollipop. How far apart do you plant them in a new landscape? Um, three feet, four feet, I'd say. And I'd, I'd like to do mounds of like the, you know, irrigate around Wayne Roderick, the Wayne Roderick daisy, uh, or the, the Glaucus sea, 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 seaside daisy, um, and, and then a coastal golden bush, <coughs> then a buckwheat, um, or one type or another, and I like, or then a pants them in, and I like to mix them in like that, but try to keep things pretty much the same size, the same height anyway, together to try to match the heights. Yeah, this is Ella Nelson's yellow, um, and this one, my camera doesn't take really good yellow photos, but it, they, they, it's a very pretty yellow, unlike the photo. Um, this is a, a Grande Robesson's uh, hybrid with latifolia that has really nice big flowers that has done really well. This is very pretty. Latifolia, the thing about it, has really pretty rosettes of leaves. Um, so even when it doesn't have the, the flowers, it, it's still a very attractive plant in the garden. The leaves are really pretty on it. So here it is again. This is the cross 
between, and I did name this one, and I forgot what I called it. <laughs> so uh, I think it, I named it after the doctor whose house it was planted at. So, if I can just remember his name. So <clears throat> anyway, growing with manzanitas, does great with manzanitas. Sure does bring color though to our garden. Here I love using um, the Lamus condensatus Canyon Prince, the, the giant wild rye there, which makes a really nice, beautiful, um, even hedge. Um, and I like to have plant buckwheats in front of it. The, there's something about grasses and buckwheats together that is real special. Here's that garden. These, I took this today, this photo today. Again. This art, manzanita in front is one of my favorite really tight, small, or short ones. Um, it's very hardy. It's the Burt Johnson, Arctostaphylus numularia, which is the, the Carmel Sur, no, what's it called? The, the Big Sur manzanita, I guess, or this, the, the flat one, numularia. One and that one is it, Bert Johnson. It's called, and it's one that was released by Tilden a few years ago, in honor of Bert Johnson. Um, here's a Grande Rubescence next to a Crocatum. Sorry, did you say that Wild Rye was Canyon Prince? Canyon Prince, yeah. Okay, it's the, the very silvery giant Wild Rye. And here's a landscape I did quite a few years ago in San Francisco in the Sunset District. We did the front yard. There's major, major problem with gophers in this neighborhood. I mean, big time. And this is all sandy soil. This is in the dunes, the Sunset District. So we did a, this landscape where we completely mosaiced the entire yard with um, stone, with cobbles, stone cobbles. So there's no room for anything to get in there. There's no way for anything to get, like a gopher, to get into the ground. And it's worked well. And then we planted manzanitas and buckwheats and things that come from a single root inside it. It's done very well. So again, though, that's like coastal, getting lots of fog, right? Yes. So South yes. Jose, this isn't going to work. Right, or, right. Okay. Right. So although, <laughs> although it <laughs> might, although it might. I mean, I do have some gardens in San Jose where these things have done very well, also. So. And that's a rubescence. Same plant. That's a rubescence, yeah. Yeah, and here, here's another combination that is really great. There are several combinations here going on. One of them is the the um, Canyon Gray. Artemisia californica, or the, the coastal sage, canyon gray, which is a prostrate one, looks great with the, with the buckwheats coming up through it. And then on the right of it is a um, ceanothus uh, gloriosus, one of the flat ceanothus ones with the fat little leaves that's a deer tolerant one, or, or one that fends off the deer pretty well with little blue flowers. It's, it's like anchor bay, but it's a flatter one, I forgot. Heart's the name. Desire. Heart's Desire. Yeah, it's one of those. There's, there's like five or six. And then you're just planting the buckwheat right inside of it to pull? To I just, next to it, and then that will cover the ground it. around it. And then the, yeah, they're, they're used to growing like that. So here you can see it a little better. What was the grass again that you said? Deer grass. There's oh. a deer grass in the background there. So is everything there California native? Yes. Yes, in the background, in the way back ground, that's uh, a uh, Aristolochia actually on the fence, growing on the fence. And then in front of that, there's uh, the deer grass. And the, now it's a, quite a bit different. There's a very, the, what's grown a lot is there's a stem right there. There's a silk tassel growing there in that corner now that's really quite large now. Silk tassel, and there's also, um, uh, uh, what's it called? The Rumnea culturae. Uh, Mataliha poppy growing in the back there, the white cloud one. Um, and then there's the deer grass, and then in front of that there's the buckwheats and the coastal sage, the prostrate coastal sage, some irises, so you know this. And here's a bunch of gilias over here, How something. Old would you say that, yeah. that planting is? I mean, in, the picture, in this picture, it's like two years old, maybe three years old. It's pretty young at that point. This was a few years ago. Some more. You can see the the way that Grande Rubescence grows there. Here, once again, this is a, com a cross hybrid between um, Grande Rubescence and the, the Latifolium. Mm -hmm. Here's a Latifolium. You can see how fuzzy they are and with really fat flowers, um, tight, low, tight to the ground. Um, and there, there's also a lot of variety in it, but these are generally general characteristics that come true. This is Latifolium, also with a nice pink flower. The bumblebee. The bumblebees tend to be 
really, they, they, buckwheats tend to really attract bumblebees to all the different bumblebees. So here's a, a latifolium in the wild, a pink one growing right next to a white one, making a really beautiful tight mound. Uh, they, they get pretty large in the wild. In the garden, they don't seem to get nearly as big. So there they are, the latifolium bloom is very pretty. Latifolium tends to be every San Francisco north, and it's, I, th I think, it, I'm not sure if it's exactly this, but it's close to it. Um, San Francisco north, all along the coast, it's latifolium. San Francisco south, all along the coast, it's parvifolium. So, this is the little leaf buckwheat. But they both tend, they both really fill up and take the spread, and they have lots and lots of them throughout. Here's a latifolium in a pot that's been growing. And here you can see how pretty the leaves are on latifolium before the flower buds. So here's latifolium in a garden in Hayward. More latifoliums. This is, uh, I think, in your yard, Diana. And here it is. Here's the, the coastal golden bush, the prostrate coastal golden bush, which I haven't had for a year now, and I've finally got a few, and I brought three of them tonight anybody's interested, but this is a really very, very hardy plant growing next to them. And they look really good with buckwheats too. And they're late flowering, so they start flowering at the end of summer. Here, growing the, the, a latifolium growing together with, an orangi with a non-native eryngium. Um, I like eryngiums a lot. I grow native ones also, but this non-native one. But that purple and the pink together is really great. Here you can really see the flower on this one. There's, um, for those of you who are interested, there's an Areogonum Society, which I'm a member of also, and I meant to put the info on that page, but um, it, you can Google it, and it's, it's a pretty neat group that you can really see how many different kinds there are out there. I don't have even that many photos of many different kinds, but there's so many that have these really tight, light, tiny little leaves and really pretty flowers, and there's a whole bunch that have flowers that start off um, yellow, bright yellow, and then turn bright red uh, over time. And those are also cultivated occasionally. They're, some of these are difficult to grow, very difficult to grow. But I haven't had a lot of luck with some of those, but I'm gonna keep trying, and I'm sure I'll get it one of these so days. They're in the thistle family though, right? No, no. 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 Oh, yeah, What's that? They, I mean, I had, eryngiums were, are in oh, the thistle family. family. Okay. Yeah, the eryngiums are this sort of. Thistles, um, but the buckwheats are not. Buckwheats are the what is the family? It's the it's the buckwheat family. Our <laughs> game. <laughs> what is it? I forgot the name of it. Anyway, it's um, <laughs> polygona, po polygonae or something. Polygonaceae. That's it. Um, so it's a, it has such an iconic look to it, though, that it, as far as like the Western landscape, I think of like buckwheats all the time, and there certainly is enough of them to go around. Here's lobii. Here's a rare one from the Sierra. This one is really pretty when it's in flower and after the flower. The leaves are really pretty on it. There's yellow flowers. It grows in the most inhospitable places, too. Um, this one is growing next to, well, you can't really see the other ones, but um, has, is anybody familiar with a plant called pussy paws? Pussy paws, calyptridiums? Those are also closely related to buckwheats. We just got the far lake of and they were growing all over the place together. Yeah, I grow those sometimes too at the nursery, but sometimes I have good luck with them and some years I don't, and this year they didn't do well, so. But um, they're closely related to buckwheats. And also the, um, what's the other things that are closely related? that are more common around here is the spine flowers. There's many different spine flowers, and a lot of them are very rare and endangered, but those are closely related to buckwheats also. Oops, that's it for the photos. Oh no, did we see this one? No, no huh? I wonder how that happened. Okay, this is a luteolum. Luteolum is another common local one, fairly common, um, but I love the bright pink anthers on the Here's a, a local endangered species, um, Luteolum caninum. This is the Tiburon buckwheat. You find this in the serpentine, the most, the strongest serpentine areas you'll find this. These ones here are really robust ones that are growing near my house in this 
serpentine area um, up in the Oakland Hills, pretty close to me. Um, we found this big patch. First, we found the Tiburon buckwheats. Then we found the, the Presidio clarkias. Then we found uh, the most beautiful jewel flowers. All of these are on the federally endangered species list. And all around us were being built houses. And that whole place was being really quickly destroyed. And it was all this serpentine area. And um, Karen Paulsell and I found this. And then um, we, we reported and everything. We were able to halt construction for a few months. Um, but eventually, of course, they won. And you know, the, 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 guy, the guy that was doing the development that was building 80 houses here, um, I think he was asked not to build, one to build one house less. And he went ahead and built it anyway. And nothing happened to him. And that, but that's the way that, um, that it works in California. There's really no weight. There's no real teeth in any of the environmental protection stuff I'm finding. Um, and it's just, I don't know, it's really maddening for me. So this area is now almost solid, um, uh, what's it called, grass, the, um, the big pompous. giant gr pompous grass. It's almost oh. solid pompous grass now. It's totally destroyed. And, this, and it was the largest population ever of the Presidio Clarkia and probably one of the largest populations of the Tiburon buckwheat ever. And it's pretty much gone now, so it's pretty sad. But anyway, this is an annual buckwheat, very pretty little thing. More of it. And sometimes it has yellow flowers and sometimes it has pink flowers. Here it has yellow. Hello. And here it has, oh, this is Luteolus. So Luteolus is also one that can be yellow or pink. Here's a mystery one from Tehachapi. Little, these, little wa these little wasps or bees like this, oops, with the red arrow <laughs> there, see? Uh, these little guys, these are the most common pollinators you see all over buckwheats. There's millions of them. It's, what's that? Yeah, everywhere. And you, yeah, and some of them are so small, they're like the head of a pin. They're so tiny, but you get a million of those on them. Oh, the red thing's still there. <laughs> okay. So now we're, oh, here's Newtom, more Newtom. Newtom is the one definitely though, that somebody mentioned it recently on the listservs that it's the one that seems to attract the most pollinators and it's true, I'll agree. I mean, one little, even if you have one little Newtom flower there, it'll be just mobbed with pollinators. <laughs> it's amazing and it can take some shade too. Newtom is also down here, especially in San Jose is probably best with only about three or four hours of sun a day. There's, no, there's a thousand, or not a thousand, but there's like about 20 or 30 different Newtoms. Um, some of the Newtoms <laughs> get very tall, and some of them stay pretty short. None of them are the most attractive, but they're, they're nice, they're okay. They're usually white. Here's the Ella Nelson's yellow. This one, the yellow color came out good in this one here. So, and the Ella Nelson's yellow really does cross with everything, with every other buckwheat you put near it, so. Here's, they're growing together with the grundy rubescence. Just speak up if you have any questions or anything. We are nearing the end of the, this part of it, and then I'll move on to the plants. So here, this is a Newtom that I found up on um, Mount Diablo, um, Newtom auriculatum. Mount Diablo has quite a few different ones growing there, and so does Livermore. The Tesla area has a lot of different unusual ones there. But this one, Auriculatum, this one has, puts out a lot of stems. Major, and they're all like this tall, so. Uh, I haven't, I've yet to see it all in flower. So here's one with a little bit of flower on it. But those ones were in. The Nudum Auriculatum, you can tell by the leaves on, on them. And I think I might have one here, in here somewhere, but they have the long, elongated leaves like that, whereas the other Nudums have generally smaller, rounded sort of leaves. Here's Nudum pubif pubiflorum. This is one that I found up on um, Mount Diablo and it has, the leaves are very green on top and very white underneath. More of those. Um, just Nudum. And here's Ovalifolium nival. Here's one that uh, is a really cool one that I grew from seed, a few of these. This is um, and then they died in the rain in the winter time. It just got too wet at one point. But I like growing these in containers. Some of them do great in containers, like the crocatum, 
Um, this one here, then the Donner Pass buckwheat looks great in containers and in the ground. The Donner Pass buckwheat turns beautiful red, the leaves turn all red and orange in the fall um, and really pretty. What's the Latin name of Donner Pass? Uh, I'll come to it in a minute, I just forgot. On um, sea cliff, buckwheat cannot stand the heat of San Star Valley. Yes. If you, I would probably give it a little bit of spray down now and then with a little bit of water, but very little. It doesn't need much. So, I mean, and you'll know if it doesn't. I mean, at least some of them will, you know. Is there a question? Yeah. On that last picture in the pot, yeah. is the base of that plant um, something else or is that part of it? So that's, those are the leaves. Those are the leaves and then the flowers come up on little stalks. That's the way buckwheats often grow. Not always, but often they grow like that. Here's one, here's an annual one that's really pretty. And I've planted this by seed before in gardens. This is Parishii. It looks like purple smoke. So, and it's pretty easy. Here's a parvifolia. This one is, looks a lot like um, Theodore Payne. And here's regular parvifolium with white flowers. Another parvifolium. And another parvifolium. Look how many flowers I <laughs> This is in Big Sur in the wild. This is like probably eight, nine feet across, this one. Then this is in the wild. You see it's the, the coastal chaparral, the soft chaparral, where it grows with the coastal sage and a million other things. There it is here too, here. So it's to salt tolerant also. It's very easy, the, the parvifolium. People that, I, I, I've often recommended it to people who have had a hard time keeping plants alive at all in their gardens, and parvifolium does really well for them, and they just <laughs> fall in love with it. <laughs> Here's Theodore Payne here, growing in a large pot. So that one does okay in a large pot. Here's Roseum, this is wan buckwheat, and this is one that just covers large swaths of land in, that are serpentine. Very, where you see the really red serpentine, like up in Napa and Sonoma, um, you often see the wan buckwheats just covering acres and acres of land. And it's really pretty, really unusual. It doesn't last long, but you can see how pretty it is in some of these photos. Just acres of it. Here's an unknown buckwheat I found down in the Mojave last year. I couldn't ID it. Um, buckwheats, there's, if you look up Ariaganum online and look for news, it seems like every month there's a new one being named. So it's very prolific. This is a cool one um, because you can, the flowers, the little florets themselves are pretty large so you can really see the, 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 um, the type of flower that it has. And it's a, this is a lot like a spine flower here, it looks like. Or, um, a, this is sort of defines, the way that this flower looks, defines what all the flowers in the, the family, the polygonaceae, family look like. They all have something in common like that, this little starfish-like pet thing with, all, with petals that are sometimes um, joined and sometimes separate. This is another one that I have here. This is a really easy one, too. This is a subalpinum one. It's an umbilatum sub subalpinum that makes a really tight ground cover, and it's easy as pie, and can take water or not. It's really, it can take quite a lot of water if you give it to it. In containers, it needs a lot of water, but in the ground, it doesn't. Um, but it's a really nice little ground cover one that turns bright red in the fall. Here's a cool one that you've probably seen if you've been down to the desert at all. This is the trumpet buckwheat. And I love the different colors of the stem, the green, the purple, the yellow, and the brown. And then this is the umbilatum shasta sulfur, a very easy shasta sulfur. Here's a wild umbilatum. Not, this, not a polyanthemum. This is also a wild one. This is another wild one, umbilatum. This is another wild one, umbilatum. So, and then here's the subalpinum again, which I have here. Then we're back to this landscape. So these are Shasta sulfurs that have gone by already. Turned, they're turning russet now. And you can extend their flowering um, for quite a long time by just being very judicious about it. A little, just get very judicious about giving them a little teeny bit of water. Um, you don't want to give them much water at all before they start flowering, but after they start flowering, if you give them a little bit of water, and don't give the water right at them, give it close to them, you know, six, eight inches away, 
and just to moisten the soil around them a tiny bit. And that'll keep them extending their bloom for a really long time. So, but you don't want to give them too much or they will die. So, more Shasta sulfurs. This one, I've had this in the container for a couple years. This is a large, really old pot nursery. Here's landscape by, it's a few years old here. Growing with Clarkias, looks good. Here's the, um, oh, this is the Shasta sulfur leaves in the wintertime. There's a nice color to it. And this is a wild umbilatum. And this is an umbilatum that is native to this area here, but very rare. It's the Bahia forma one, Bahia forma. And it's, a, it's one of the sulfur buckwheats. You see this one up on Mount Hamilton and Mount Diablo. It's very rare though, but it's a pretty little thing. And I've tried to grow it, and with not too much success, but this is in San Ramon. Um, this is the Bahia forma again. It's pretty, pretty little pinkish flower and pretty bright leaves. Oh, this is the Donner Pass buckwheat. So it's Umbelatum torianum. And these turn, these leaves turn bright, bright red and orange and yellow in the wintertime. And purple, excuse me. Here's a, here it is when it's purple. So and these are the flowers on it. So it does well if you have a cool, kind of a cool location. This is uh, one of the righty eyes. This is another local one. This one is the righty eye um, trachophagum or something like that. There's a couple over here. Um, but this, this one here is more of an upright one um, with pink flowers on it, very pretty. Um, white and pink flowers. And it has another one. But then there's, the, then there's this one here, which is the subscaposum, which I have some here today. For the first time, I was able to get some. Um, the subscaposum is a very tight matting one, like this. And it is na locally native, but pretty, very rare. It's also on the endangered list. Here it is here. Here it is there. And here's the, th these are the leaves of the East Bay Wilds buckwheat. The very bright green. So, and we're back here. And I'm pretty much, and here's uh, arborescence growing in a head <laughs> of the nursery. Um, here it is growing with a prostrate golden bush here too. And here's landscape in the Oakland Hills. And here's my dog Lucy with a lot of folio. <laughs> So, and this is that weird sport that had the, um, that the small white flowers all over the whole thing of the Catherine, St. Catherine's lace. And the leaves are really yellow on it for some reason. And here's Diana's garden. And here's a, just an unusual one that I found. I think it might be Angulosum out on a Mines Road. So growing, another plant that grows great with them is the, is, um, and I brought a couple today, is the, the um, this big purple one here, our native rosemary, the Trochostoma lanatum, or woolly blue curls. Likes the same conditions. Butterfly, growing with the verbena again. So, and now we're starting over, so there. Well, let's stop this, and I'll go to the plants now. So, um, the plants are all for sale, and the anything, any plants really that are in a really good growth period are fine to plant in the summer. I have no problem. You just have to keep an eye on them and make sure that they don't get um, too, too dried out. You have to really check the soil next to them every day for, to find out how long it takes to dry out and then give them water probably two, three times a week, a little bit of water and don't put it, a whole bunch of water right at them, but about six, eight inches away, let the water slowly seep in um, and it's fine to plant them now. They do great. So. Um, and, and here I have all, these are all buckwheats, these are all buckwheats, all different kinds, and some of the labels are right and some of them aren't, so <laughs> <laughs> double check with me on this one. And then these are friends of buckwheats, so we have the heteropica, the gold, San Bruno golden asters, which are great with, with them, then we have the woolly blue curls here, which I just cut back, uh, coyote bush is another one that does really well, the prostrate coyote bush. Um, Penstemon, Catherine de la Mer here. It's a nice spreading ground cover one. Wayne Roderick, which is the seaside daisy that's more drought tolerant than the others. And then of course the Zoshan area is the, the California fuchsias. And the um, dune, the, what is it called? The Sandhill Sage, the David's Choice, and different epilobiums. There's a bunch of different Zoshan areas and the labels are correct on those. And then these are the, the prostrate golden bushes that are super hardy and really they flower really late in the season. 
and here's an unusual little rig around. Who knows what it is? <laughs> uh, and then this here is a little. Please, I forgot the name of it. This is a little teeny um, aster, and I forgot to bring up the name of it with me. Um, but anyway, this is a really cool, tiny little aster that's really easy to grow, and it stays really small and spreads and forms a nice little cushion, um, like the buckwheats. And so it's a really great one to plant, like the subscaposum one. Um, or a container plant, and it's really easy, this one by seed. It has these little teeny weeny little yellow flowers on it, and it's pretty. So, um, so that's it. Could you so any questions? Yeah. The yellow, the yellow ones right here in the middle, yep. what are the growing conditions and the name and everything? They like the same growing conditions as, the, as buckwheats, hot and dry. Um, they can take a little bit of water. Um, and I do give them a tiny bit every couple weeks. They'll just spray everything down. Enough water to get the dust off the leaves, you know? That's what they like. So San Bruno Golden Master. Yeah. Full sun. Full sun. I already use less sun than others. The arborescence. Okay. The arborescence, definitely. As far as the non native ones, these are pretty much all sun. And among the buckwheats. But among the buckwheats, the arborescence, yeah, there's several arborescence. And then there's crocata, which is also a good one. And the natives. And I have the, the little five inch, four inch pots are $5, and all the others I'll do um, $10 except for the woolly blue curls. I've got to do $12 on those. So, yes? Are there any that we have here? Yes. Yeah. That have a chance of surviving deer? That's, deer is a really big issue. Yes, it it's is. a really big issue with that, you know, and I, I don't know what to say about that. I, I planted the, the, the Shasta sulfurs, have done very well with them, but the first year they always get all their flowers eaten off them. And, and, and it hasn't, they haven't worked everywhere. So, yeah, I don't know. Has it, what about anybody else? Has anybody else had any success with the fasciculatum? I bet you you could. I have sulfur buckwheat, the deers gave it a haircut. Yeah. Oh, so they lost it a few days. Yeah, and then the deer ate them, right? Yeah. How long have you had them? I planted them last fall, so this spring. So it's the first year. The first, first flower. And yeah. All gone. Well, let's see how they do in a couple of years because the deer might leave them alone <laughs> for a while. So I think fasciculata, you'd probably have the best chance for the fasciculata. Yeah. And there's a bunch of different fasciculatums here. There's foliosums, there's that Werner Lytle, and then there's um, also the straight paint. Okay, with, well, whatever, if we, we can always move this outside um, if, we, if we need more time, so. But you're welcome to come up and uh, check out the plants now. Thank you, everybody.